Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So this is another uh, video in my series on the Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 3. Uh, it's about objects, placing them on your map. And so in that sense, it's a larger scope video, much like I did one on Secret Doors on the Mad Mage's Level 1, in which I was talking about why using Secret Doors in a dungeon, what purposes they serve, and I used the Secret Doors that were given in that uh, dungeon as examples. Same thing here with objects. There are plenty of uh, various inanimate objects that are described uh, in the text on the Level 3 Mad Mage. I'm going to talk about the ones that I decided to use, the ones that I didn't use, and why, and just the purposes they serve. Because as I've said before, I think that having objects, I think that having an electronic map from something like the Mad Mage is really useful. Uh, if you are you know, running at a tabletop, uh, if your players are mapping this out to put those in there, but even if they're not, uh, if you're going to draw, you know, like a battle or a room for a battle on a battle map with a grease pencil, it's good to know what objects are there, where they are in relation to one another, how they block access, that sort of thing. And even theater of the mind, just to know as you're running it, players are entering the room, they try to do this and try to do that. You've got a, uh, a visual aid to help you to see where those objects are. So let's enter the Dungeon of the Mad Mage level 3 using Dungeon Draft to see the objects that bewitch and bedevil our player characters. Alright, so here we have uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage that I created. I've put these objects on here. Let's go up to this uh, the start of the map and as you can see I've got these catacombs that are in room number one. There are no monsters here. Uh, it's just these catacombs, these ancient dwarven things where dwarves are buried. There's nothing really of interest. I drew these in uh, using individual blocks. If I go like that, there you see it. Uh, if you, uh, let's, let's move a, uh, what I did was I made a, a block and just started copying them. If I move this over like so, and I show you the trace image, there is what was shown on the map. Uh, if I say Control Z, back in place. The nice thing about this is, if you did have a creature there, let's say you have a wandering monster, or let's just say you're, you're building something like this in your own dungeon, there are line of sight things. So let's look at this in something like, uh, this is Fantasy Grounds, we have a character in this very room. If we turn on the line of sight, we click that character, this is what he sees as he's going through here. He moves up like so. He goes like this. If I want to see what I can see, there I can see everything else. I can see there's something there, right? But he comes up like this, and boom, he sees a troll, right? That's, and then when you come back, when he goes down like this, he can still see a little bit over here of what he saw before. But again, that's the thing about the line of sight, okay? So it's kind of cool. So here we are again, and notice uh, in here you have uh, some Gricks that are waiting in this room. I, you know, again, they, they didn't describe any rocks or anything. The Gricks don't need rocks to hide behind. They're up on the ceiling. doesn't really matter. Uh, if we come over here, this is where you've got face spiders in here with some of their victims, and it's described as being very webbed. It's like, you know, very difficult terrain. You can burn it with torches. Uh, there are some creatures in 4A that are uh, guarding these here. Quagoths, and they, um, if they hear anything, they are going to run down to area five. This is where the drow have their command post. They're the, the two power sources, the drow and the hobgoblins on this level. So I drew all these uh, webs in there and some of their victims. I believe there's one that's uh, alive. All right, and then in here, in room six, I didn't put, there's not a lot of objects, but there is described above the ceiling all of these webs that uh, have bodies in them but if i make webs again like this it can be a little bit distracting is the room totally obscured well in fact it's not all the webs are up in the ceiling so i chose not to do them similarly you have these jail cells one dead body in the jail cells the others all have uh actual living things if i'm going to run this with a you know a, uh, uh, a, a virtual thing i'm going to put those tokens on there or whatever this is kind of cool down in here. This is the drow torture area. You've got this table here where people are being tortured with all these implements. Uh, here's a table where people are they're doing like a water torture thing. 
Uh, we also have this where this refuse entrails and whatnot, and these four drow priestesses are lounging on their chaise lounge and another torture table here. So I wanted to put those in. Okay, again, this is this uh, hallway of winds and everything. It has spider webs, but they're kind of blowing in this wind. This room 19 is interesting. It's a pet shimura here with all of its refuse uh, that is, or chimera, however you want to describe that, uh, that is uh, run by the uh, drow priestesses. Over here, this is this, now we talked about this before in terms of the um, overall setup where they had these underground cities. Or, uh, it was originally a dwarven city that, that collapsed. You have this abandoned part that nothing is here. It's been stripped clean by adventures and whatnot, but there is rubble. So I did put rocks and things in here, strew this with rubble, but there's really nothing here of any interest. Again, if you want to have random monsters, you can. If we go into 21, it says, even though this has been abandoned, there's all sorts of trash and refuse that the players could find, but no one is living there. Why? Because down here, you have an Oni eating the children. One of the most gruesome monsters in all of the monster manual. Uh, it has a little store, it has little items, it's all supposed to be junky. Here is this child's toy, actually it's a goblin child. Uh, she is in 21B, the players will meet her among the refuse, she's just totally like a goblin urchin. She's lost her doll. Uh, the players have an opportunity to meet the Oni if they so choose. So once we get into the habitated areas, notice there's a lot more stuff to put on here. Uh, this is an area where the, uh, the goblins have all their supplies, all their wretched food they eat. Uh, this is the treasury of the head Azrak. There's an altar where they uh, sacrifice people. And also he's got treasure chests. Also these thrown over former uh, idols to the dwarves. Uh, Azrak's living quarters. Here is a gate. Uh, we, I've talked about the gates before. And again, I'm going to get more into this. I'm just talking about these objects here because the idea is when you, you know, this is where this gate is. You know where it is. You're not necessarily looking through. The players see it, especially electronic. Uh, here's some trash in 21Q. This is a morgue with, with zombies in it and all sorts of bodies and whatnot. So 21O is an orphanage. <laughs> it's really depressing with little children's toys. But notice, too, there's all sorts of rooms that aren't keyed, and so they are not of any interest. And here's an interesting thing. I don't have the doorway to that. Where is that? Oh, this has gotten moved. This is what happens when things get screwed up. They get moved. Can I figure this out just on the fly? There you go. All right. I'll go like that and put the door in. Like this, so. Okay, turn that off. Okay, there's a door there. But if the room isn't keyed, it doesn't have anything of interest. Uh, this, let's see here, this is, I believe, a Mind Flayer embassy. Uh, and again, this is where all these, uh, these goblins and hobgoblins sleep. Uh, more refuse in here. Oh, this is where the Mind Flayer ambassador up here is keeping his... Uh, intellect devour. See, the, Xanathar loves these intellect devours. It's a big part of this whole thing. So he's got these dogs in here with all this trash, and he's got intellect devours, you know, lurking in the trash to get unsuspecting players. Talked about this in many earlier videos. Intellect devours are pain in the ass. Okay. Uh, this is an armory. And again, this is a mess hall where the, uh, the, the various hobgoblins and goblins eat. And this is trash from area 20. This is the drow village. And we have some interesting things here. This is the head priestess, Trissa. You've got some guards there. And again, they describe this very, they say, you know, she's got uh, uh, stuffed heads on the walls, uh, her bed. Uh, she's got these, you know, various furniture. So I put that in there. Uh, 20D, um, this mirror, demon mirror. It's got all these... Um, and in fact, oh, do I should I put a mirror there on there? So I could say, let's see, oh, I'll just say mirror. All right, let's see, I'll put that on there. There you go. It'll snap off, maybe there. Yeah, I put it there. 
put it there because it doesn't want to line up. All right. So now I've got a mirror in that room that the demon speaks through. Now that's an unused uh, water basin. This in 20C is a feeding trough that the three Quagoths use. They're feasting on their victims. So again, if the players come in here, there's, you know, opportunities to, if you're having a battle, this thing might get in the way of that battle. And that's what you're going for here. This is an interesting thing in 10A, which is the beginning of the coven of hags. They describe this as having these pebbles on the floor, such that when you uh, step on these in 10A, you warn these Grimlocks that are in 10B. And so they hear the noise and they come out and they feed at this point. 10C is where the sea hags give these pools of water in here. I made it a different color. They're supposed to be sort of more filthy or whatever. Here you've got these geysers that are exploding in 10D. And all it does is soak the roof, the 20-foot roof. This doesn't really have any effect. Stone cauldron here. These are the nud bones of the hags. Uh, when they're victims, they carefully stack these. And if we go back in here, this is where they have all these boats that they've taken. Uh, they have this statue here, uh, which basically warns them, if any, this figurehead. Uh, if you go in there, if you throw a dispel magic on it, then, you're out of, then it doesn't warn them. But otherwise it warns them and the hags come running. Because within all these rowboats is their treasure. So you put these in. The idea here is to you know, have this. This is difficult terrain if the players are going to try to go through that. Got some boats here. These are rafts that you can use, the players can use to go down the river Sargoth. This is a ferry boat that Hallister has made. It has a skeletal ferry captain uh, that will also take you places you go. You just want to make sure to pay him a gold piece per passenger. Uh, these are statues, some form, some not, from when the, the dwarven days. There's a fake one here that the players can discover. And of course, this information stuff, like this X, like these rooms for the player's map, I wouldn't have that on there. Stairs to the next level. Uh, there's another gate in 15B. This has some dead bodies. It was a recent battle. There's another gate to, I think, I think the sixth. Again, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have all that for you when we do this. These are kind of interesting. These are cliff faces. These are uh, rooms that are above the river. And this is kind of a cool feature to think about. Instead of just the usual room coming out of there, to have something like a cliff face here. I think that's a really cool idea. All right. That's the dead body of someone there. Uh, and there's creatures that are up here. I can't remember what they are. We'll have more of that when we talk about that. All right, so that, this is a, the refuse here. There's dead bodies piled in this room because it is, I believe, an Odia, I don't know how to pronounce, Odia Glare, right? It's got, uh, and he's friends with the hobgoblins or whatever. Uh, if you're with the hobgoblins, it doesn't attack you, but it's just a classic lair, so the dead bodies are a nice touch. And over here we have, these are these funguses that the goblins grow. I didn't have fungus objects, so I just made multicolored plants. You know, uh, do they, they don't really obstruct everything, but the idea here is that the, uh, they, you know, fungus is, I think there's a devil's fungus or something in here. These, by the way, are guest chambers if you're guests of the uh, hobgoblins. So there you have some objects that you can place in your dungeon when you've recreated it to use electronically, tabletop, whatever. I find this really useful. It only took me maybe an hour and a half or so to do it. That may be time you're not interested in. You may be satisfied to just use from the book. You know, the, the dungeon is keyed. You just correspond. But I just like that. And especially since I use a battle map with minis, I like to be able to place those items, know exactly where they are. All right, so the next time I'm going to talk about my standard uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage analysis where I talk about, you know, the major power centers, the resource drains, uh, some of the different features that are interesting, all of which is both uh, to homebrew your own dungeon, design your own uh, mega dungeon kind of concept, but also if you're interested in running the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. And if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Please leave some comments because I love to read them. Most importantly... Keep playing D&D &D and tell somebody else about it.